All right, welcome everyone. If you're just joining in, we're gonna give it a few more minutes. Thanks for being here for the Lobos of the Southwest 10J Rule Comment Writing Webinar. So we'll get started with a little welcome announcement uh, right on the hour. Uh, give everyone a few more minutes to get connected. Thanks so much for those of you who are already here for joining us. All right. Well, welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today for this webinar focused on preparing all of us to write our 10J rule comments that will count to help Mexican gray wolves. A uh, little background information. At the end of 2020, our last official count of our U.S. population of Mexican gray wolves was 186 in Arizona and New Mexico. And in New Mexico, we only have about 35 to 40. And that makes these wolves one of the rarest native species that we have here in the Southwest. Currently, the US Fish and Wildlife Service is revising its 2015 Mexican gray wolf 10J management rule. And a federal court found that that rule does not rely on the best available science and violates the Endangered Species Act by failing to conserve the endangered Mexican gray wolf. So that's what we're here to talk about today. 11.59 Eastern time on January 27th, 2022, marks the end of a 90-day public comment period, which is your opportunity to demand that the agency follow the court order and base the revised management rule on independent academic science rather than political pressure. We also want to clarify that this is separate from some of the other wolf-related campaigns going on right now. This is not related to wolf hunting, in the Great Lakes or Northern Rockies, um, nor does it relate to red wolf recovery or the effort to relist gray wolves nationally. Uh, we do support robust legal protections for wolves wherever they may roam. But tonight we're focusing on the critically endangered Mexican gray wolf in the Southwest. So I'd like to take a few moments uh, for us to introduce ourselves, our panel here to help you today with crafting your comments. Uh, my name is Erin Hunt and I'm the coordinator for Lobos of the Southwest. Uh, which is a group of volunteers and conservation organizations, scientists and educators working together to recover the Mexican gray wolf. So Roz, uh, would you mind introducing yourself? Yes, I'm Roz Switzer. I'm the middle Gila broadband leader out of Florence, Arizona. And Great Old Broads for Wilderness advocates for wild lands and wild places. Thank you, Roz. And Chris? Hi, my name is Chris Smith. Um, I use he, him pronouns, and I'm coming to you from my hometown of Santa Fe in the southern Rocky Mountains where lobos should be roaming and I hope will one day roam again. And this, this land where I'm coming from is on historical Tewa speaking territory. And I'm excited to be here with you. I work for Wild Earth Guardians. Thank you, Chris. Emily? 
Hi, uh, my name is Emily Wren. I'm the executive director of the Grand Canyon Wolf Recovery Project based in Flagstaff, Arizona. Um, I use she, her pronouns, and this is the traditional homelands of many tribes, including Navajo, Hopi, Havasupai, Wallapai, and Apache tribes. Thanks. Thank you, Emily. And Dave? Hi, I'm Dave Parsons. Uh, I uh, was once the, uh, the first Mexican Wolf Recovery Coordinator a long, long time ago. I had a career with the Fish and Wildlife Service. I now represent uh, two groups, the uh, Rewilding Institute and Project Coyote, and I serve as a policy and science advisor to the Lobos of the Southwest. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. And Aspen? Hi, everyone. I'm the assistant coordinator for Lobos of the Southwest. Um, I am on Eno land and I use she, her pronouns. All right, thanks Aspen. So without further ado, we wanna thank you again for joining us. Uh, we're going to begin our presentation given by Roz Switzer and Chris Smith. After the presentation, we're going to have a question and answer period. So you'll be able to use the Q&A feature in Zoom uh, to type in your questions and we will read out those questions and our panelists will respond to that um, to help you prepare to write your comment on the Mexican Wolf 10J rule. I'll do a reminder about that before we begin the Q&A, but you can start typing in your questions into the Q&A at any time and our panel will respond together after the presentation. So with that, I'm gonna hand things over to Roz. Go ahead, thank you. Thanks, let me get my screen shared here. There we go. All righty. Well, meet the Mexican gray wolf, whose scientific name is Canis lupus bailii. This is the most genetically distinct subspecies of gray wolves in North America. And they all have this distinctive coloring that you see, um, this brown and, and darker. They all have that coloring. They are about the size of German shepherds. So why should you care about this wolf? Well, wolves are keystone species. They do profoundly influence the ecosystems. And these landscapes have evolved with wolves. They keep the elk and the deer moving, um, which increases the diversity of life in riparian areas and other areas as well, but especially riparian areas. So without overgrazing, species that depend on these streams and meadows, um, these habitats, such as birds and beavers and fish, uh, they do recover. So wolves are nature's best stewards. So let's set the stage for where recovery uh, is at today. So this picture, this map on the right shows the historic range of the Mexican gray wolf. We can see we have Arizona and New Mexico here, um, where the current recovery is. They were in Texas, uh, all the way through Mexico into Central America. Of course, they were outside of this zone. You have intergradation zones where a subspecies mingle, um, but this is just the main historic uh, zone for Mexican gray wolves. So the disappearance of wolves can be explained by perceived competition with humans for land and prey, um, but mostly it's just an intolerance for predators. Wolves were trapped, they were shot, they were poisoned by both private individuals and also by the government. This picture on the left shows a couple agents who are the predecessors of what we know today as wildlife services. They were actually down in Mexico, um, eliminating the Mexican gray wolves there as well. So the last three Mexican gray wolves were killed in Arizona in 1970. And then the Endangered Species Act was passed. And then the Mexican gray wolf was listed as an endangered species in May 1976, but there was a problem. Uh, there were no Mexican gray wolves left in the uh, US or anywhere in the world that anybody knew about. 
So US and Mexico did collaborate to capture all the remaining lobos that they could find if they even existed and to start a captive breeding program. And they did hire a trapper, his name was Ray McBride. He had actually participated in the extermination of these wolves in the US. He was one of the main trappers, which is why they hired him to see if he could find any wolves. And uh, he headed down to Mexico. So in 1977 and 1978, Trapper McBride did capture four Mexican gray wolves, and this did start the captive breeding program here in the US. So meet Nina on the right there. She was the only female who was captured. The three other males who were captured actually were determined to be her pups from the previous year. Now, when Nina was captured, she was pregnant, but her wild mate was never found. Um, so she was pregnant with um, pups from a wild mate and she did give birth, but the lone female of that litter died. So once again, that would left Nina as the sole, sole female of her subspecies. She did not conceive in 1979 or 1980. And she's now eight years old. She's approaching the end of her reproductive life. And it looked like the captive breeding attempt to save the species was going to fail. But Trapper McBride in 1980 did find one additional wolf in a different state in Mexico. It was an unrelated male called Maximilian. And he was brought into the captive breeding program. And um, Nina became pregnant. And then tragedy struck, Maximilian died. So the future of the species hinged on these pups that Nina was carrying with Maximilian. And in May, 1981, Nina gave birth to four healthy pups and three of them was female, were females. So this attempt to bring the Mexican gray wolves back initially consisted of genes from three founders, Nina, her wild mate, and Maximilian. Um, now I should note that there were two additional lineages found. Uh, one was in a zoo in Mexico and one was in a captive uh, facility in New Mexico. So all of the Mexican gray wolves alive today uh, come from these seven founding wolves. So you can see from the beginning how the stage has been set for a struggle to provide the necessary genetic diversity in this population uh, in order to, so that it can adapt to uh, environmental changes. So the captive breeding program continued for 20 years and in 1998 they determined that they had enough wolves in the program to do a release into the wild. And on March 29th, 1998, three family groups consisting of 11 wolves were released in Arizona within the Apache National Forest and in a zone that's referred to as the Mexican Wolf Experimental Population Area. It spans Arizona and New Mexico. So the bumpy road to recovery in the wild had begun. As of the end of 2020, the population is 186 wolves. That's currently 44 packs, and there's five wolves known to be roaming solo, 17 packs in Arizona, 27 packs in New Mexico, and there are 20 breeding pairs in 2020, and that means that they have pups surviving to the end of the year. So this increase in wolf numbers is, is good. Um, we're, we're good, we're glad to see these numbers increase, but we also need a healthy population. And the larger a population is, the harder it is to accomplish genetic rescue. So I'd like to thank citizen scientist Peter Osorio for this graph. What it shows is um, the difference between genetic diversity in the captive breeding program and genetic diversity in the wild. So genetic diversity is the total number of genetic characteristics in the makeup of a species. The more genetic diversity a population has, the more likelihood it can adapt and survive to uh, changing conditions such as new diseases and climate change. So what we see here is that the species survival uh, 
program with their captive breeding facilities have done an excellent job of maintaining that genetic diversity in that population. There is about 50 captive breeding facilities with about 350 wolves um, currently there. If we look in the wild, uh, we see the opposite, that the genetic diversity in the wild population has plummeted over the years. Wolves in the wild are related like siblings. And this is a direct consequence of continued loss of genetically valuable wolves in the wild. So in addition to natural deaths and poaching, we have had both federal and state agencies contributing to this crisis by removing and killing genetically valuable wolves. And then the second factor in um, this loss of genetic diversity is that there has been a lack of releases of well-bonded adult wolves and families from the captive population to the wild. So let's talk about what's truly needed to recover these wolves. So 20 years of recovery data led to a 2012 draft recovery plan. This was prepared by independent scientists who were working for the US Fish and Wildlife Service. And they concluded to have a recovered, stable, genetically healthy, ecologically effective, and that means affecting their niche in the environment in the healthy way this predator should, um, to have a population that was all of that, then the following was needed. You needed three core populations in the US, totaling at least 750 wolves, with a minimum of at least 200 wolves per population. And I stress that these numbers are a minimum only. These populations have to have connectivity between them, and that would allow these species to, to withstand disease or a catastrophe. Um, you would have two other populations still existing. It also would allow dispersing wolves to mingle and introduce new genes into the separate locations. The last two things is that the wild population needed genetic rescue and that human caused mortality had to decrease substantially. So uh, let's look at this map. What we have here, here is Arizona, New Mexico, and here is the Mexican um, wolf experimental population area right here. Now the independent scientists did identify two areas that were available for two new core populations. And that was the Grand Canyon ecosystem that we see here. And then the Southern Rockies here, uh, spanning Colorado and New Mexico. We can see that we have uh, wildlife connectivity between all, all of these areas. We can see that we have excellent habitat in these areas as well. So let's look at the rest of the map here, just so we can orient ourselves. Here's the Yellowstone ecoregion up here. Here's um, good habitat in Montana, in Idaho with existing wildlife corridors. And there are wildlife corridors that come all the way down and uh, connect both regions. Now it should be noted um, that the US Fish and Wildlife Service did disband this group of scientists. They ignored their findings when drafting their 2015 10J management rule. And that's the rule that the courts have now ruled inadequate. So let's look at one of the factors, the human caused mortality. So in 2018, we had a record number 21 Mexican gray wolves found dead. And there's a very high percentage of illegal killings. It is estimated at around 60% of wolf mortality. We know we have a minimum of at least 105 Mexican gray wolves that have been um, determined to be killed, illegally killed since 1998. And far more than that have just disappeared. The photo on the left here is uh, the latest victim, Anubis, who was illegally killed on New Year's weekend in the forest outside of Flagstaff. So these wolves do need specific actions to address poaching. They need stronger legal protections, more robust law enforcement, more serious charges for violators. States could close hunting units or not allow 
coyote hunting in a particular area. And also there needs to be more funding um, for public education efforts. Another problem we have is that livestock owners are not required to adopt non-lethal techniques to reduce conflict on our public lands. And there's many, many proven tools available. Number one, you remove carcasses so that you don't attract uh, these wolves. Number two, you keep the livestock operations away from the den and rendezvous sites where these wolves are trying to raise their young. You could have livestock calve at the same time so that you can increase protections when they are most vulnerable. Um, that happens more in the Northwest. In the Southwest, we, we have livestock that wander around our public lands and they calve year round, uh, which makes you know, protection much harder. There have also been some um, good experiments where they have taught livestock to, they, to hone their uh, instinct for herd behavior. So if they act more like a herd, then they're less vulnerable. And you can protect livestock with guard dogs. Uh, fladry, fladry are the narrow plastic strips that flap in the wind. And for some reason, the wolves don't like to cross those. So you can uh, protect your livestock, especially sheep with that. Uh, you can use range riders. Uh, you could use scare tactics, um, which are used quite a lot. So let's look at um, one of the changes that the US Fish and Wildlife Service wants to make. So they're proposing temporary restrictions only on the take of Mexican gray wolves on federal land, on non-federal land, and in response to unacceptable impact impacts to a wild ungulate herd. So it sounds good, but it really has little effect on current practices. This is talking about the official removal and killing of wolves by livestock operators who are authorized by the US Fish and Wildlife Service, almost all of which is done on our public lands. So the US Fish and Wildlife Service will still have the management flexibility to kill and remove wolves. And even more flagrant is that when these temporary provisions end, the language of the new rule will actually make it easier to kill and remove Mexican gray wolves going forward. So if we look at unacceptable impacts to a wild ungulate herd, um, a predator should never be killed or removed for eating its natural prey. And uh, you know, are they serious uh, that there may be unacceptable impacts to wild ungulate herds? Um, just look at Arizona. We have 60,000 elk here. The Arizona Game and Fish, their own website states that land managers continue to be concerned about habitat quality and elk livestock competition. So the annual elk harvest numbers by hunters have and will remain at a high level. So in short, um, these proposed temporary changes really do nothing for the long-term uh, survival of the Mexican gray wolf. So I am going to pass um, the presentation on to Chris Smith from Wild Earth Guardians. Thank you, Roz, and thank you everyone for being here. Um, it's embarrassing to see that there are people on the, the webinar to whom I owe emails. Apologies. Um, and I should also say that uh, I'm actually building off of a presentation that Roz, Roz previously built. So um, more thank you to Roz. I'm going to try to share that now in any, um, any kind of uh, sign from another panelist that that is going well would be welcome. All right. Um, okay, so I'm going to talk about some of the, the other kind of glaring problems with the rule as it's been proposed by US Fish and Wildlife Service. And to me, um, the, the most glaring and most befuddling aspect of the existing rule um, for Mexican gray wolves was that they were designated as non-essential. And it's a legal term that essentially means um, that Fish and Wildlife Service thinks that the wild population could be wiped out and Mexican wolves could still recover in the United States. Um, and they base this on the supposed ability of captive breeding facilities to replace the wild population of Mexican wolves. And this, this, this essentiality claim 
um, is especially close to my heart because Wild Earth Guardians brought this claim in our lawsuit against Fish and Wildlife Service over this rule. So we think it's really important both for Mexican wolves, but also for other species under the Endangered Species Act. Um, again, Fish and Wildlife Service said that you know, we can just replace the wild population if something happens, they're not essential. But since that initial rule came out, captive breeding facilities um, have actually cast doubt on that claim, um, saying that maybe that's not so easy. Um, but even, you know, if it's possible, it's kind of like saying, it's fine if the dinosaurs die off or are wiped out, we'll just kind of find a multi-billionaire to build Jurassic Park. It's not efficient, it's not cost-effective, and it just plain doesn't make sense for the only wild population of Mexican wolves in the United States to be considered non-essential for the recovery of the species in the wild. Um, it would make infinite more sense to designate these wolves as essential, and that would mean two important things for Mexican wolves. The first is critical habitat designation. Essential species get habitat designations that kind of help them survive in the world. Mexican wolves happen to be generalists, so that's less important to them than other species. The other, I think, really crucial thing that an essential designation would give to wolves is it would make other agencies like the U.S. Forest Service or Bureau of Land Management or even the Department of Defense have to consult with Fish and Wildlife Service when they're planning things and say, hey, we're going to do X. Does this impact Mexican wolves? And Fish and Wildlife Service would be able to say, yeah, actually it does. You need to do X differently or you can't do X. Um, so that's why we feel very strongly that these wolves should be designated as essential. Um, Roz touched on this a little bit, but Mexican wolves used to roam throughout the Southwest United States, um, deep into South Texas, all the way up into Utah and Colorado, and of course, across most of Arizona and New Mexico. And right now, U.S. Fish and Wildlife has them fenced in almost like a zoo to this very narrow section of their historic range, which is shown on the map there in orange. Um, and when Mexican wolves roam out of this small experimental population area, which is what it's called, they're captured, um, often at great cost to the American taxpayer, and taken back to this sliver of approved habitat in the, the Gila bioregion. And sometimes they're actually taken out of the wild entirely, not just taken back to their approved habitat. But again, as Roz pointed out, the best available science indicates that in order to fully recover, Mexican wolves need three distinct but connected wild populations. And of the most suitable areas for additional populations, the two that stand out are the Grand Canyon region and the Southern Rockies, where I'm coming to you from today. And both of these are made off limits by the Interstate 40 boundary, which is the northern boundary of this Mexican wolf experimental population area. And Fish and Wildlife Service intends to keep this as is, even though there are real strong indications that this actually stymies the recovery of the Mexican gray wolf. There's nothing ecologically or biologically significant about Interstate 40. I'm sure most of you who have driven along that can um, confirm that. Um, it's an arbitrary boundary at best, and probably better called a politi political boundary. Um, we want wolves to be able to reestablish throughout their historic range. So moving the Interstate 40 boundary and giving wolves access to critical habitat in the Grand Canyon and the Southern Rockies is really important for their recovery. So we would ask U.S. Fish and Wildlife to expand the Mexican wolf experimental population area and especially move that northern interstate 40 boundary enable to, to enable two new US populations. And um, to be very clear, wolves would reestablish in these areas if they were allowed to. Um, this is Anubis, which you already saw, um, was recently um, tragically and illegally killed north of interstate 40. Um, the second time he roamed up there, the first time he was captured and taken back to the experimental population area. And the message that keeping wolves in this tiny zone sends is that wolves don't belong and that we don't really care about true recovery. So when U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service says, yeah, we want to recover Mexican wolves, but they don't follow the science that would enable them to recover, 
I think it sends a message that in some ways implies that killing wolves when they're outside of that boundary is okay, even though it is illegal. And while we're on the topic of kind of wolves and their ability to roam, um, it would be a mistake not to mention that wolves and wildlife more broadly are prevented from effectively move, moving and migrating by a slew of human built infrastructure, including the border wall, which was made much more um, unfriendly to wildlife under President Trump. Um, the map on the left hand side here shows Mr. Goodbar's travels. Mr. Goodbar is a Mexican wolf who clearly intended to go south into Mexico, um, but came across the border wall numerous times and eventually turned around and went back north, um, essentially prevented from going into his historic habitat by this wall. Um, and if Lobos were designated as essential, then agencies like the Department of Homeland Security would have to consult Fish and Wildlife Service about how things like the border wall impact Mexican wolves. Okay, this, this one is a little bit more complicated and I used to talk about this using forest analogies, but I'm gonna use a basketball analogy instead today just to provide a little bit of variety. Um, again, Mexican wolves, as you saw from Raz's slides, face a looming genetic crisis that is getting worse, not better. Um, the good news is that there is diverse genetic material among captive wolves that could help with this situation if that material was allowed into the wild. The bad news is that Fish and Wildlife Service doesn't seem that interested in really confronting this problem. Um, in their new draft rule, they propose releasing wolves from captivity, mostly as pups, um, until 22 captive born wolves have survived to breeding age. Um, but many wolves that survive to breeding age don't end up breeding, um, just like people. Uh, in wolves, it's because of social structures. Um, most wolf packs have a dominant breeding pair, while other wolves, um, even adult wolves in that pack, don't breed. Um, moreover, just because a wolf breeds, that doesn't guarantee that his or her pups will also go on to breed. So what U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service is saying is we're going to take you know, X number of shots, 22 shots in this case, and that's how we're going to win the basketball game. Um, and that's a problematic approach because as we see here, not all shots, even the, thing, the ones you think are going to go in, actually go in. And it's even more disturbing because Fish and Wildlife Service actually knows the score of this basketball game in real time. They have data that they collect on an annual basis that tells them about the genetic health of the wild Mexican wolf population. So why don't they just use that data, which they already have, to determine when they have put adequate DNA from captive wolves into the wild population? They should release captive born wolves until the genetic health is adequately improved. Um, it seems really simple to me. I would do that. Um, and they should do it expeditiously because this is a crisis. And the way to do it expeditiously is to release captive born wolves that are adults, that are in bonded pairs, that have pups. So you're essentially releasing families into the wild, which ensures, or doesn't ensure, but makes more likely that they will survive and makes more likely that they will contribute their genes to the wild population. And then finally, the last point I'll touch on is um, the population objective that Fish and Wildlife Service is proposing, which is to can you continue to aim for a wild lobo population that is artificially suppressed by management, which is you know, killing and removing wolves. Um, again, the best available science in indicates that there should be three distinct populations of lobos in the wild that are connected by dispersing wolves to exchange genetic information. Each of those populations, those subpopulations, if you will, should be a minimum of 200 wolves. And the total number of wolves in the Southwest United States should be 750 at a minimum, according to the science. But Fish and Wildlife Service continues to propose 320 wolves on average um, as the target for their population, which to me signals more evidence that they aren't serious about recovering Mexican gray wolves which is why we're serious about it. And we urge you to be serious about it and help us tell 
U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to do right by these wolves. And Aaron Hunt is going to tell you how to do that right now. Thank you so much, Chris, and thank you, Roz. Uh, so before we dive into everybody's great questions, I can already see some coming up in our Q&A and our chat. We wanted to give just some general pointers on how to make your comment count in raising your voice for Mexican gray wolves. So a few tips you can try out. You might consider starting your comment out with a question. Uh, one of the most important things about comments is that they're unique from each other. So it's not really a numbers game. It's not about just the sheer volume of comments submitted. It's really about the quality of the comments. Um, each comment needs to be unique. It needs to be personal. It should have references and citations. And another way to set your comment apart to make it feel unique is to start it out with a question. For example, you could ask US Fish and Wildlife Service, why aren't you designating Mexican gray wolves as essential? And putting that question right in there in the front of your comment will require the service to address that in some way. So that's one tip you can try. Um, definitely make it personal. These are complex issues, and maybe there are a few aspects of it that speak to you on a more personal level. So please feel free to share your personal experiences as another way of backing up your arguments uh, for why we need changes to the 10-day rule that help with the long-term conservation of the Mexican gray wolf. Um, it's important to add references and citations and arguments for why you believe one way or the other uh, that changes to the rule are needed. Uh, but it is okay to personalize those and it is okay to speak from the heart because we're all very passionate about the survival of these rare wolves. Most important thing you can do is to sit down and write it. January 27th is our deadline. That's just a few days away, but it's not too late to make a difference for these endangered wolves. Um, we're gonna share some resources via email uh, after the webinar, some links that can help you and you're welcome to contact us for more information but we do suggest setting some time aside for yourself, put it in your calendar, put it in your to-do list and get your comment written. Uh, you can also send a copy of it to your elected officials so that they know that you care about wildlife and public lands and the future of Mexican gray wolves. You could use your comment as well to draft a letter to the editor or an op-ed article. And that's another way to share uh, your feelings about Mexican gray wolf conservation and potentially encourage others to make a difference too. So um, we do have some contact information and a couple links up available on the next slide. Uh, we will share these links. I'll drop them into our chat tonight, but I will also make sure everyone gets a copy of these in an email as well. Uh, that first link is the direct link to submit your comment if you'd like to do that online um, through regulations.gov. Uh, we'll give some additional information about instructions on how to do that. You can also mail your comment in as well. So we'll share that information with you. And a lot of the points that have been brought up in our presentation today are also available on our website, uh, mexicanwolves.org slash change dash 10j dash now slash. Uh, so we'll share those links with you too. And if you have questions after our webinar today, um, Chris and I are both happy to chat via email, provide more resources, answer questions, review drafts, whatever you need. We're here to support you in crafting a unique comment that helps Mexican wolf conservation. And I think with that, uh, we are ready to transition into our question and answer portion of the evening. So we've already got some questions in the chat, some questions in our Q&A. Um, I'll go ahead and jump back and forth. I'll read those. And for our panelists, uh, if there's a question that appeals to you, feel free to raise your hand and let us know you'd like to speak. Um, I think we can also maybe take down that slide so everybody can see our panelists. So we'll start out with um, a general question. Linda is asking, is there a limit to how many times you may submit comments? And I think I would encourage writing a single comment, but making it comprehensive um, with references and cited sources, because it's really about the quality, not the quantity for this particular case. Um, other panelists, if you have anything to add, go ahead. I think that's right, Erin. Um, but I would say if you have submitted a comment and uh, you thought of more to say, you should absolutely do that. So in that regard, there isn't a limit. Thanks, Chris. 
All right, and then I know we've got a few questions that came up during the presentation, so we'll go through these. Um, I believe this came up during Roz's portion, but Heather is asking, what papers did the gene diversity data come from? Um, so Roz, I believe that's the slide with the graph uh, that the our concerned citizens, uh, concerned members of the public put together. <laughs> Um, but that data was taken from the Mexican Wolf Species Survival Plan, uh, the stud book, which is their record of the lineages of all of the wolves. So Roz, did you have anything to add on that question? Uh, no, Dave might though. <laughs> all right, um, our next question. Uh, talking about coexistence techniques, any comments on llamas as guardians against wolves? Uh, do any of our panelists have any thoughts on that? Yeah, we can talk a little bit about that. Uh, from the standpoint of livestock protection, uh, they are effective guard animals, but their animals have to be in a fairly tight herd for that to be effective. And on our Western rangelands, the livestock are often widely dispersed and, and not in tight herds. So I don't know if that could be particularly effective on open range. The other thing um, I've heard uh, from people who use llamas is that they are um, more effective in preventing a, a single or maybe two animals from, from depredating on livestock, whereas um, they're less effective if a, if a pack is present. All right, thanks, Dave and Chris. Um, kind of another general biology question. Have uh, you seen lobo and coyote mating? Um, can anyone speak to prevalence of that? The answer is yes, they can, if I heard the question correctly. Uh, although it is, for reasons not fully understood, not prevalent. Uh, particularly in the western United States, it's more per, more prevalent in the east, and uh, that can be sometimes explained by the fact that that as wolves and coyotes you know, repopulated, they were their populations were low and widely dispersed, and so the fact that they can mate uh, came into play when perhaps they could not find another mate of their own species. Thanks, Dave. Anything to add to that, Emily? I did uh, just more recently hear a presentation by a geneticist, uh, Melanie Culver at U of A. Um, and she does have a student, I believe, who is looking at that research right now. Um, I know she had a PhD student do a genetic research on Mexican wolves and domestic dogs, because that was a common question that's come up um, and unfortunately, that's often used um, by anti-wolf um, interests often make this claim that Mexican wolves are hybrids um, with either dogs or coyotes. And um, that research did find that they were not actually hybridizing with domestic dogs. Um, there was very little evidence of that. And what evidence they did find was very ancient in the DNA. Um, lineage for Mexican wolves. So um, I I'm sure we'll see uh, more published um, research coming out on that topic with coyotes as well, but that does not seem to be prevalent. Thanks, Emily. Uh, moving on to a kind of different realm of questions. Um, Kirby has a couple potentially related questions. First is, are recovery zones tied to protected parks or protected habitats? And second is, could there be designated wildlife crossings installed for animal access? Um, so maybe focusing on that first question first, are recovery zones tied to protected parks or protected habitats? Any panelists want to speak to that? I'll start it off. Yeah. Uh, the answer is sort of yes and no. Uh, the recovery zones for Mexican gray wolves 
uh, and the habitats that they are expected to uh, prefer and uh, inhabit are largely on public lands, but they're not protected in the sense of something like Yellowstone National Park. So there are multi-use lands where other, other activities take place, grazing, in some cases mining, logging, hunting, uh, are also uh, taking place on these lands. So what we lack with Mexican wolf recovery is a truly protected core zone like they had in the Northern Rockies with Yellowstone National Park. Thanks, Dave. Um, and perhaps anyone willing to speak to that second question of could there be designated wildlife crossings installed for animal access? Um, I'm happy to speak to that a little bit, um, although other people work on that more than, more than I do, so feel free to chime in, but um, yes, uh, the state of New Mexico just released a draft plan to install um, wildlife crossings in various strategic places. Um, none of those in the draft are specific for Mexican wolves, but um, certainly that's a possibility down the line. And we do see quite a bit of wolf mortality due to vehicle accidents. So I think it's something worthwhile. Yeah, I think the same true for Arizona. There's uh, quite a few groups that have proposals there, but a lot of it is the funding. They're very, very expensive. And I also, uh, I'm not sure if you're referring to the, the border with the US and Mexico either in terms of those wildlife crossings, um, but it has to be understood that um, in, there's a 2005 Real ID Act that allowed the Department of Homeland Security to waive all environmental laws uh, along the border for I think it's up to 100 miles, don't quote me on that. Um, and so that allowed a lot of this blockage that you see, this, uh, these wildlife um, corridors and this wildlife habitat being blocked uh, because there was no um, NEPA prep process, the National Environmental uh, I think it's Protection Act anyway, that uh, gives us the right to comment, um, you know, and have has comment periods. So all of that was waived, which allowed these wildlife corridors and wildlife habitat to be blocked between the Mexican and US uh, population. And so that actually takes an entirely different process to open up those uh, wildlife corridors. I can right. also just add a comment on what we know about I-40 um, is that, I mean, there are no current designated wildlife corridors or crossings of I-40, um, but Anubis did cross I-40 many times um, in the time he was in Northern Arizona at least 10 times. Uh, I haven't counted all of them yet, but um, he actually was very good at crossing using the culverts under the highway. So we know for sure that he was definitely using um, large drainage culverts to cross successfully. Um, so at least we can give wolves um, some credit that, that hopefully they can find those and be successful in using them. Thank you, everyone. Um, before we move on to our next question, if you're able to, we're getting some great comments in the chat, but not everyone can see the chat, I think. If you'd like everyone to be able to see your question, if you want to use the more button um, to click Q&A, you can type your question in the Q&A, and that way all of the attendees will be able to see it, and people can move their thumbs up next to your question if they'd also like to see that answer. That'll be helpful for us if you're able to drop your questions into the Q&A. Um, I will go back and forth through, through covering everything in both the chat and the Q&A. So um, Q&A question from Sarah, are there tribes involved in the reintroduction of this native species? And does anyone know their take on reintroduction? Um, any panelists want to speak to that? Um, I'll start, but I'd love for other people to chime in. And I think Emily, you've done you've done some work engaging with tribes, but I, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, yes, there are there are tribes involved. 
Um, there is a vast diversity of perspectives on wolves and Mexican wolf reintroduction among tribes. Um, so I think it's problematic and harmful to homogenize that. Um, and it's my understanding that tribes and pueblos within the recovery area have special consultation on processes like this. Um, sure, I can add just that the currently the White Mountain Apache tribe um, is a cooperating partner with the Mexican Wolf Recovery Program. So they're the only tribe that is officially part of the program and they do have their have wolves on their lands, um, as well as their own tribal biologists who study those wolves, um, but they keep that information proprietary to the White Mountain Apache tribe. Um, and over the years, there have been um, some tribes that have opposed uh, wolf reintroduction on their lands or have asked for dispersing wolves to be removed, but, but that does shift over time. Um, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service has a white paper called Tribal Perspectives on Mexican Wolf Recovery, and I, I can try and find that and drop that link for you in the chat. Um, but it is definitely a, a diverse um, perspective. And this year, thankfully, we do know there was a, an emergency relisting letter uh, that was sent to Secretary of Interior Deb Holland um, that was signed by all 22 federally recognized tribes in Arizona supported that letter. Um, so that wasn't specifically about Mexican gray wolf status, but, but all 22 tribes in Arizona did sign on to that letter um, in support of emergency relisting. And then there's also a wolf treaty that has been circulating by the Global Indigenous Council. And the, I believe there's now over 700 tribes represented um, that have signed on to that Wolf Treaty. And uh, a number of those include tribal members in the Southwest, although they might not be representative of the whole tribal government. Um, there are members of different clans um, from tribes in the Southwest that have also signed on to that wolf treaty. So that's a positive thing. Thank you both. Um, next question, is there an age requirement for who can write letters? I'm guessing comments. Um, so can middle school students do it if they would like? And I could briefly speak to this, but we'd love other panelists to jump in. Um, I think the answer is yes, uh, there is no age limit. Uh, we encourage participation from everyone. I think if uh, we can help those middle schoolers, maybe include some sources, some papers and things that they can reference, it's really great practice for writing, um, maybe writing like a scientific report. So uh, yes, definitely. And if you are looking for another way to help the young wolf scientists in your life engage with Mexican wolf recovery, uh, we're also coming up right to the end of our annual pup naming contest where students from kindergarten through eighth grade can suggest names and do journaling and do artwork um, and help us put names uh, to the pups that were born in the wild last year. Um, and that's a way to help tell the stories of these unique animals. Um, Anubis is an example of a wolf where that wolf was named by seventh graders and that really helped us tell his amazing story as he journeyed. And it's going to help us remember him even after his tragic death. So it, that's another get, way to educate young people about wolves, help them make a personal connection and help them make a difference in telling the stories of these amazing animals. Um, so we'll share the link to that as well. Um, any other panelists wanna speak to age requirements or legal considerations when it comes to official comments? I mean, I would say it's, you know, a, a middle schooler's comments may not be weighed more than another comment, but that middle schooler has a lot more time to hopefully experience Mexican gray wolf recovery than, than people like us. So this, yeah, this is, this is for the American people at large. And I would, I would recommend anyone submit comments. 
All right. Um, next question, uh, Jan is asking, isn't it very risky to possibly lose captive breeding pairs to releases with their pups when so many Mexican wolves are killed? Once that rare pair is gone, the loss of genetic variety would be so much more reduced. Um, any panelists want to speak to that? It seems like one you should answer, Erin, although I'm happy to. I think I can speak uh, in, in my previous life. I worked at one of the SSP partners in the captive breeding program, um, raising some of those wolves that got a chance to be released. I had the honor of participating in cross fostering twice. Um, it's scary to think about what might happen to those wolves once they end up out in the wild, but that's also the reason why we do this work. Um, the organizations that are participating in the Mexican Wolf Species Survival Plan aren't doing that to keep wolves in captivity. Um, we do that to make sure that those wolves have a chance at the wild future that they deserve. So there is risk involved to, with releasing wolves. Um, both due to natural causes and due to human caused mortality. But when we're talking about the survival of the subspecies and an opportunity to restore them to the wild where they belong, that's a calculated risk that can be worth taking. And then it's also up to us to make sure that there are robust legal protections in place to keep those wolves safe. So my opinion is, yes, there's a risk, but that's a risk that's worth it as long as we have good policies that are protecting those wolves on the landscape. Any other panelists want to add anything? I said to that, uh, uh, well said, Aaron. And on top of that, there are expert population and genetics managers in the captive breeding program that make sure that uh, gene diversity is maintained at the highest possible level in captivity. And they also make sure that a wolf going out to the wild is not so unique that it would be jeopardizing uh, unique genes that are not available in other wolves in the captive breeding program. So there's some redundancy plan there in case that wolf dies. It's not, uh, you may not actually lose gene diversity. You just lose an opportunity to get that diversity infused into the wild population. All right, um, hearing no other additions on that one. Um, next question, um, Eric is asking, how much does US Fish and Wildlife Service use the public's letters in making their decisions? Is this largely a pro or con number issue? Um, does anyone want to speak to that? Well, I can speak to that because I've managed this process in the past. Um, the, the answer, regretfully, is that they, uh, they don't tend to use comments as much as they should because many fine comments are submitted, but we often don't see the result in a revised document. It's, uh, it's very frustrating to me uh, when, uh, when I ran this process, 30 years ago or so, uh, we actually, we read all the comments and we made changes for between drafts and final documents reflecting the comments we got that were, that were valid. Um, and that's what the Fish and Wildlife Service is supposed to do. And it's what we need to do in our comments is provide the best information we can where we think maybe what they've proposed is wrong or inadequate and what needs to be done to make it better. Uh, the, the, uh, the end result often is that when comments are not adequately uh, adopted by the Fish and Wildlife Service, they find themselves in court, which is, which is where we find ourselves today in that the rule they passed, they put out in 2015 was, was found to be not adequate by the court. It was found to be unscientific, found to be not adequate to uh, lead to the recovery of the wolves. So in this case, we have a stronger hook because we have an order from a federal court that lays out all the provisions that need to be addressed and improved in the new rules. So we're using that, uh, and I'm personally using that as a backdrop in my comments to recommend what needs to be done 
to make the rule compliant, in this case, with the federal court order, which gives us an extra, extra leverage. All right, thanks, Dave. Um, and if I can add maybe an additional perspective on that in talking with the people who are coordinating the comments now, um, I think for a lot of us, it can feel frustrating when we spend all this time and put all this effort into generating lots of you know, thoughtful and well-researched and cited comments and to feel like maybe the service isn't listening. Uh, but I think there are some great biologists working on the team who will be reviewing the comments. And I would encourage everybody to submit your comment and let's hope that those comments are respected, that the, our voices are included, and those comments are used to make substantive changes to the 10J rule that can serve Mexican gray wolves for the long term. So a little bit of hope to add on to yep. the realism that it is a challenge when we feel like our voices aren't being heard. So I definitely want to acknowledge that frustration that comes from that. Thank you, Erin. I didn't want to mean that it's unimportant to <laughs> submit comments. It really is important uh, because they become part of an official record. And it's very likely that the result of this comment period will be that the folks who took the Fish and Wildlife Service to court the first time will bring them back to court for not adequately addressing the court order. And we need to document that in our comments. And that's that's the record that the, that the attorneys can use to uh, hold the fish and wildlife service feet to the fire, so to speak. Thanks for adding that, Dave. I feel like this is a cooperative effort where you know, there's the litigation side where there's accountability through the court system. And then there's the part that each one of us as concerned members of the public can play uh, in putting our thoughts and our research and our ideas um, and our demands that the Endangered Species Act be followed and conserve Mexican gray wolves into the public record. So we definitely encourage all of you to do that. Um, okay, next question. Uh, Heather is asking, where can I find the most recent publication of the Mexican wolf species survival plan and stud book? Um, I can briefly answer that. Uh, the SSP doesn't often publish that in easily accessible public spaces. Um, that's something we are encouraging the SSP to do because it's a really important reference and could be very educational for a lot of people to have access to that. Uh, but that may not be something that's easy to access right now. So sorry if that feels like a non-answer. Also apologies for the crying dog in the background. <laughs> Does anyone else have any um, thoughts to add about the stud book? I don't, but if um, if this person emails me, I may be able to track someone down who has it. And I'll type my email in the chat again. Thanks, Chris. All right, moving on to our next question. Uh, the original 11 wolves that were, are, were released, um, I think the question is, were they released in Arizona? I believe that was Roz's portion of the PowerPoint. So um, yes, they were actually released um, very close to the Arizona, New Mexico border. Um, the original release area when they started was called the Blue Range Recovery Area. And um, it was right there at the Arizona and New Mexico border. And, uh, but it was in Arizona that they were released. All right, thanks, Russ. Um, next question. Do we know if some private agreements have been made with any group or organization by the Fish and Wildlife Service to resist the science-based recommendations for the success of wolf restoration? Any panelists want to speak to that? I'll speak to that. I, I don't know that you would call it private agreement. But the Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, by law, is, is obliged to cooperate and coordinate with other entities that have an interest in some way in the lands that might be affected by wolf recovery. Fish and Wildlife Service has interpreted this, this commitment to mean only essentially governmental agencies. And in this case, they have recruited Somebody help me with the number, but 25 or 30 
cooperating agencies, mostly uh, states and county and local governmental entities uh, as formal cooperators in developing the proposed rule. I argued strongly in my comments that the, the, they misinterpret the wording of that requirement because it says they're supposed to cooperate with any persons having an interest in the lands affected by uh, the proposed project. And those lands are public lands. 90, 95% of the uh, wolf recovery area is public lands. And those lands belong to the entire public. And I make the case in my comments that they, they shouldn't be giving insider access to, to, a, to, to just a subset of politically motivated entities, most of whom are really not supportive of full Mexican wolf recovery. That they should let everyone come to the table and have input into the process. Thanks, Dave. Um, another question that might tie into that as well, uh, Christine is asking, is the Fish and Wildlife Service politically motivated in these recovery plans? They appear to care very little about recovery if they want to bank survival of a species on captive breeding programs rather than focusing on the ones already in the wild and putting such a small range they are allowed in as if they are trying to cage them in. Is there a way to make them more independent from political influence? Any panelists want to speak to that? Um, I'll answer the first question, which, you know, I think, yes, they are politically motivated. And um, if anyone has met with Fish and Wildlife Service staff or attended any of their information sharing webinars on this management rule, um, you know, that they'll go out of their way to, to, to seem unbiased politically but they will let slip that there are political reasons that they are doing what they're doing. So my answer is yes, and I don't have a, a good answer for the second part. And I'm also, I'd welcome any panelists to, to disagree with cynical me. Uh, just piggybacking on the first part, um, it does appear that the changes that um, are being proposed uh, which aren't very many in the rule. Uh, it does appear that they're just trying to uh, fast track, and this is my opinion, fast track delisting um, and get these Mexican gray wolves delisted as quickly as possible, whether um, it leads to their recovery or not. And anybody can disagree with me too. <laughs> I'll add a little bit on that. And there's plenty of evidence that that maybe they're not politically motivated, but they're politically influenced and they, and they respond to those political influences with uh, often unscientific uh, proposals, which is why, why we are where we are today. Because the court clearly found, which is very unusual for a court, they found that this rule was not based on best science. Uh, there is a mechanism within the agency and the uh, Department of Interior for, for uh, supposedly assuring scientific integrity. And there are policies on that. And those policies in the case of highly controversial be independent peer review of documents being produced. And, and that has happened with the original 2015 rule happened with their uh, 2017 recovery plan. And they've now had an independent peer review of this particular proposal we're looking at now. All those peer reviews have almost always been highly critical of the quality of the science being used, uh, integrity of the science, and the fact that science was not actually followed. But almost universally, those peer reviews have not resulted in the agency making any substantive change to the document to address those critiques. So there's a breakdown in that scientific integrity process that fails to require the agency to actually act upon the, uh, the scientific peer reviews. And
All right, thanks, Dave. Um, I think the court cases also have sometimes played an important role in highlighting the lack of um, following the science, and that does provide a mechanism, hopefully, for accountability as well, um, going through different branches of government um, to make sure that our policies are science-based. Um, Emily, you wanted to add? Yeah, that? I could just add um, to this that in the case of the I-40 boundary, is the northern boundary for the recovery area, um, unfortunately, we do know that has been very politically based um, in documents that have been uncovered um, by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, um, and especially influenced by the state wildlife agencies, um, including Arizona Game and Fish. They just do not want to have wolves north of I-40 in the Grand Canyon region because that is some of their trophy elk and deer hunting areas. And so they've resisted wolves in this area for a long time, but, but we do have evidence over the years that they helped um, shape that policy um, by getting the governors of the states involved um, to write a letter opposing wolves north of I-40, as well as um, then in the 2017 uh, recovery plan in the creation of that draft, um, they they wrote in the meeting minutes of one of their recovery team meetings that they just capped the habitat models for geopolitical reasons at I-40. Um, so they, they've just clearly kind of stated that themselves, um, unfortunately. So I can't refute the, the case that Chris and Roz and Dave just made that there's a lot of political influence and compromises, especially to the states. And I think that comes down to ultimately the US Fish and Wildlife Service, you know, feels that when any animal is delisted from the Endangered Species Act, then management will be returned to the states. Um, so at that time, so they, they give a lot of deference to the state agencies in creating the plans to recover those species. Thank you, Emily. Thank you, everyone. Um, next question. Uh, Bob is asking for clarification about whether or not population caps have been removed. So Fish and Wildlife Services webinar, they're stating that the population cap has been removed. Um, so just asking for clarification about that. Any panelists want to speak to that? I'll take that just in case I misspoke um, in talking about the population cap. Um, it's true that there was a population cap and the Fish and Wildlife Service is proposing to remove that population cap. Um, the population cap was 320 wolves, and now they're saying they're going to manage for an average of equal or greater than 320 wolves. So technically, it's no longer a cap, but I think um, there's reason to believe that the on-the-ground management won't change if, um, if they're still targeting you know, right around that number. So hopefully that clarifies it. I have one other point to make on that. That is that the, uh, the court order clearly stated that the Soil Law Service should not be linking this management rule to the binational recovery plan that was finished in 2017. That plan has a recovery objective of 320 wolves in the United States and 200 wolves in Mexico. Uh, even though the court was very clear in stating that the Fish and Wildlife Service could not rely upon a recovery plan, which is not an official document, and especially when part of the recovery is being, uh, being uh, handed off to uh, a foreign country where we have no authority, that, uh, that it was inappropriate for the Fish and Wildlife Service to link this management rule to the recovery plan. But they've done exactly that with over almost 60 references in the <laughs> proposed rule that they're gonna link this new rule to the recovery objectives of the recovery plan. And that objective is 320 wolves, 320 wolves in the United States. They say that they'll manage in the interim for a population around 320, but 
in the end, if the recovery objectives are met based on the 2017 recovery plan, the wolves will be delisted and the recovery criterion for the United States is 320 wolves. And that gets passed off to the states and that's what you'll see in state management plans. So, so it's, there's a lot of what I call smoke and mirrors in this proposed rule where they claim they're removing a cap, but the end result is the, the old cap was 325 and this one is pretty much a de facto 320. So it, it can be argued that they're actually lowering the cap rather than raising it. All right, thanks everyone. Um, next question. Coyotes are unfortunately wildly reviled and thankfully very difficult to exterminate. Uh, I recall that introducing wolves to Yellowstone region helped to control coyote populations. Uh, in other words, restored the wolf as apex predator and coyote to a more scavenger role. Do you think the same can be true in the Southwest and can this be used as a benefit when talking to ranchers? Any panelists want to speak to that question? I would say absolutely. Um, the, the benefits that you've seen in the Yellowstone ecosystem would definitely um, uh, be the same as what you would see in, in the Southwest ecosystem in terms of the wolf being the keystone predator and then um, the balance returning. Thanks, Russ. I could add one. One nuance to that, uh, when you look at Yellowstone National Park, that was that created an unexploited wolf population that was allowed to grow to its full ecological potential and ecological carrying capacity. So, so that dynamic uh, was created, recreated in Yellowstone National Park, where nature comes into balance because. Because all you know, every animal in the ecosystem is allowed to seek its own level, so to speak. Well, to the extent that we control wolves in the in the Mexico wolf recovery program to protect things like livestock, and and we limit numbers to 320, which is nowhere near the ecologically effective population. Uh, we may not. I mean, we'll see that interaction when if wolves and coyotes come into into the same general area, they'll, you know, the wolf will have the advantage, but I don't know that we'll see it to the extent that we saw it in Yellowstone National Park. Thanks, Dave. Uh, next question. Uh, Greg is asking, I've heard that of the seven founding animals that only two of them were female. Is that true? Um, Roz, I think this might've been mentioned in your PowerPoint. Yeah, I was assuming that three of them um, were female because you had a lineage in, uh, in Mexico and you had a lineage in um, New Mexico. So I was assuming you had a male and female in both of those lineages. Can you confirm that for me, Dave? Or someone? <laughs> yes, that's true. Well, is presumed to have a male and female founder and the Coast Ranch Village is the same. And the uh, uh, one female founder. Add that up, that's how we get seven. All right, thank you both. Um, next question is the opposition to wolf recovery by the livestock industries, or is all of the opposition by the livestock industries? Is there anyone else? Any panelists want to speak to that? Um, I'm sure others will have things to add. I think not solely, but mostly. Um, I think the the livestock industry is the the major opponent of wolf recovery, and their talking points and their messaging and their battle is taken up by groups um, who may not have the same interests, but out of convenience do that. Uh, 
I mean, we do know uh, for Mexican wolves as well, there have been some big hunting lobbying groups that have been in involved over the years in opposition to Mexican wolf recovery. Um, for example, I believe it was Big Game Forever, which is based in Utah. Um, they la uh, were an organization that leaked one of the the first drafts of the 2012 recovery plan um, and kind of blew that process up by that public leak on their website. Um, so they got involved and then um, used their lobbying power, I think, to get a lot of the Utah state elected officials opposing Mexican wolf recovery in the state of Utah. Um, and then also Big Game Forever, um, sorry, not Big Game Forever, uh, Rocky Mountain Elf Foundation has a long history of interfering in wolf recovery um, in other states, but for Mexican wolves, we, we know that they have been funding research that's being done by the state wildlife agencies on wolf predation of elk in Arizona and New Mexico. None of that research has been published. So um, I believe none of the research is actually showing what the results they want, <laughs> which is not showing any kind of a dramatic impact on elk herds in the Southwest due to Mexican wolves, um, but they have provided a good amount of funding for that kind of research, um, you know, biased research, unfortunately. So uh, yeah, so there are some hunting groups also involved in opposing wolf recovery. All right, thank you everyone. Um, next question. Is there any evidence of Mexican gray wolves migrating to northern New Mexico? Any panelists want to take that one? No, I'm not aware of any of that. The, the habitat connectivity is a little thinner uh, between the current recovery area and say the Southern San Juans in New Mexico, it's not as robust as the connectivity along the Mogollon Rim, which is what's been followed by wolves that have gone uh, northwest and crossed I-40. Uh, there are, I mean, the, the, the habitat analyses show that potential connectivity is there for wolves to move to Northern New Mexico, but I'm not aware of any that have been reported beyond say the El Malpais area and some have gone a little uh, north of, uh, well, have it. I think they might've gone north of I-40 in that El Malpais area, but I'm not aware of any major migration. Thanks, Dave. Anyone else aware of anything to add? All right, uh, next question. Uh, which, if any of the issues, do you think has the best chance at reforming the proposed changes in the 10J? Or is that hard to predict at this point? Any panelists wanna to speak to that? I'm a little confused by the question. Um, if the question is which, which of the issues we brought up will impact wolf recovery the most? Um, I'd have to think about that. If if the question is which which is more likely to be changed, um, then my answer might be the Interstate 40 boundary. But I don't quite understand the question. Maybe someone else does. I believe Edwina, who is asking the question, um, dropped yes into the Q&A when you said the one that will make the most difference on wolf recovery. I think so, I, could, uh, I could expand on that if I may. I think there are three really critical changes that would make a big difference. Taking down the I-40 boundary and the boundary altogether, which has never been part of any other wolf recovery program. Wolves have always been 
allowed to go beyond the boundaries of their experimental designation, but not here. So one, take down the I-40 boundary. Two, remove any cap to the population and, and just wait for whatever the final recovery plan is at the time to be met and then delist according to that. So you don't need a cap, it's not necessary. Uh, and then the third is to change the designation from non-essential to essential. I think those are the three most important changes we're hoping to see out of this process. All right, thank you. Anyone, other panelists have any thoughts to add to that? I don't, but I think um, that's a great example of a question you can ask in your comments, um, as well as if the US Fish and Wildlife Service can give any examples of other endangered species in the United States that had a, a designated boundary that they weren't allowed to cross or a population cap or, or like objective that would be managed beyond that. Um, I've asked that many times over the years and I've never gotten a, a solid answer from them um, as an example of any other species, but I would love to keep asking that question. <laughs> and I'll just say that after more thought, Dave's list is my list, I agree with him. All right, thank you. Um, and we do have those points that Dave brought up in our talking points as well, which we'll sh make sure we share again after the webinar is done. Um, next question, uh, with increased plant-based meat products on the market, is the number of livestock trending downward yet, or is it too early to know? If demand for livestock increases, the opposition by that industry should decrease. Any panelists wanna to speak to that? Um, I think that uh, demand for meat is not very related to public lands cattle grazing in Mexican wolf territory. Um, the reality is that a, a very small amount of beef comes from um, the, the kind of grazing that conflicts with um, wolf presence and um, and the notion that uh, public lands ranchers, especially in really arid places um, in the American West are, are feeding a lot of America is false. And most, most meat comes from kind of feedlots further East. So I'm not, I'm not saying that um, the question isn't important, but I think it's important to note that um, there's not a lot of meat coming from the ranching we're talking about. All right, thank you, Chris. Um, next question, uh, why are the ranchers and cattle people so opposed to using non-lethal methods if those methods do indeed work? And why isn't Fish and Wildlife not giving them incentives like monetary incentives? Does any panelists wanna to speak to that? Well, the first part I might say is because they don't have to, and it takes effort to um, use coexistence techniques, even though it's the right thing to do. So if there's no requirement to coexist with, an, with uh, the Mexican gray wolves, then you will have um, a lot of your livestock operators who choose not to. Okay. That's a very good point. And there's a talking point, you'll find that where uh, I think it's important for those who care about this issue to recommend that all conflict situations be uh, first attempted to be resolved by non-lethal means. And in fact, until that's shown to be completely ineffective, and then you might consider other means beyond that, but non-lethal ought to be the standard, standard method for addressing uh, conflict situations between wolves and livestock. All 
right. I think there's 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 also um a sense of entitlement among some but not all ranchers that um they believe they have a right to be there and wolves don't and their cows have a right to be there even though they are not native to this landscape and wolves don't um and so I think that um that opposition to to using non-lethal tactics I think there are a lot of livestock owners who are starting to use them but the opposition um actually stems from an opposition uh of wolves being on the landscape at all or any carnivore being on the landscape all right thank you everyone i'm going to share a couple things that have been dropped into the chat um, so comment that um, Carrie is a middle school teacher in Portland, Oregon, and they're fighting for the Pacific salmon and the breaching of the Snake River dams. Uh, they've been looking at different types of power, specifically social norms, ideas, and numbers, and vocal mass. The students started looking into wolves when they learned that eight wolves were poisoned in Oregon. And this is a long way to say that they started looking into wolves in different places, Yellowstone and the Northern Rockies and the Southwest, and finding hope by taking action. So Carrie is thanking us for our work, but Carrie, we would also like to thank you for your role in educating young people to take action, to raise their voices, to be stewards of our wildlife and our wild places. So thank you for everything that you're doing. Uh, we have so far answered all of our questions in the Q&A. We're coming up right around to the end of our webinar. We can maybe have one more minute for any final questions. If anyone has a burning question you'd like to add to the Q&A. And I will also drop some links into our chat. And we'll make sure that you get copies of these links emailed to you as well. So that's several links that we've discussed today. We'll send a copy of that too. Um, I do want to thank all of you for attending tonight. And if you have any remaining questions, please don't hesitate to reach out. Um, email myself, email Chris. Uh, we'll send that follow-up email as promised. And your most important next steps are to start writing a comment of your own on the Mexican Wolf 10J rule. And to make sure that you submit that to the US Fish and Wildlife Service no later than 11.59 PM Eastern Standard Time on January 27th, 2022. So that's this week. Mark that on your calendars. Make sure you set aside some time for yourself to write your comments. Mexican gray wolves urgently need your help. So please make sure you get those comments in and be a voice for wolves today. And please make note of the time zone. So it's not midnight for you unless you're on the East Coast, so. Easiest right. just to do it right now. <laughs> yeah, if you're still, still awake and alert wherever you are in the world today, write your comment right away. I'll reach out if you have any questions and we'll be here to support you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you all.